particular chapter is cardiorespiratory endurance, and so this is um, where we start talking about breaking those uh, components of physical fitness down. We talk about them a little bit more specifically, how we program for each of them, how we assess all of them, um, but before we kind of go into like how we actually do these things or what we need to look at there, we first talked about the body systems that are affected. So with cardiorespiratory endurance, um, it affects mostly the heart and the lungs. You'll see benefits to your muscles and you'll see benefits in other ways, but it's mostly gonna see benefits to your heart and to your lungs. And so you guys covered kind of different circulations, like there's a, a circulation that goes from the heart to the lungs, and there's one that goes from the heart to the rest of the body so that we can move oxygen, right? Get oxygen in and then get it to our system. Um, one of the biggest things I wanna make sure you guys know is this thing about diffusion, okay? The entire body works off of diffusion, okay? Everything that you're capable of doing, like looking at me right now, hearing me, chewing gum, uh, moving, sleeping, whatever that is, you're able to do through diffusion. So diffusion is simply taking a high concentration of something and then moving to a low concentration, okay? Kind of think like if it started flooding outside, right? There's not a lot of water inside, and so that water wants to get inside, and if it can, it's gonna rush inside until the levels are equal. Does that make sense? Right, you guys following with that? Mm -hmm. So diffusion is the most important process in the body. Everything you do happens through this very simple process. Um, and so you've got your arteries and your veins. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry it towards the heart. And then the one thing we really wanted you to make sure you knew about the respiratory system besides things like your lungs and mouth and that type of thing is this thing called alveoli. And it's the furthest air can move. When you breathe air in, it goes into your lungs. Eventually it gets to a spot where it can't go any further. And that's called the alveoli. It's kind of like the stopping point. But a very important process happens in the alveoli. What important process that maybe I just discussed happens in the alveoli? Diffusion. diffusion. So what happens is this air gets into the lungs and it can't go any further, and then it diffuses basically through skin into your bloodstream so that it can be carried. And this helps keep diseases out, keeps us healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of like a filter. So. You guys had these, which um, you guys don't need to know for the exam as far as labeling, um, but are there as a visual representation as we were going through that last slide. Um, and then you got another one that kind of shows the heart. Um, and so the last thing I had you guys kind of look at on your own besides the benefits of cardiovascular endurance exercise was basically we know that your heart's beating right now and that you guys are breathing right now and that you guys have a blood pressure right now. And we know those things change when we exercise, right? Typically they go up because what our body needs is more things so we need more blood we need more oxygen so our heart beats faster we move more blood around which is what heart stroke volume is and cardiac output is um, we breathe more right all of these things are going on and so our body has to be able to change things very rapidly Does that make sense right and so where we want to go with this conversation is we need to talk about energy production when movement happens movement happens because we have we basically are utilizing energy Okay, and typically when we talk about energy, we're talking about it most of the time you guys think about metabolism, right? You guys have heard of metabolism before? Yeah? What's metabolism like? What's an, what's an easy way to think about metabolism? What is it? What actually is metabolism? Like, how your body like, processes food and stuff. Okay, so it's a little bit about how we process food, but it's actually kind of doesn't have to do with as much of us processing food. Metabolism is processing more energy so really metabolism is how much energy is it taking to keep me alive that's really what we would be looking at so how much energy is it taking to keep me alive at this particular moment yeah so if you have a high metabolism your body is trying harder to keep you alive can be can be yeah so basically it means we're burning more energy so if i have a high metabolism it means i'm utilizing more energy and typically the only reason we use energy is to keep us alive our bodies don't like to use energy unless it has to Okay, now there are medical conditions around that which change that a little bit. And we'll talk this semester about how can I increase my metabolism so that it literally takes more energy to keep me alive every second of the day. And so this can be beneficial because then I get to eat more is how the way I look at it. For some people, it may help them lose weight or maintain a weight. Does that make sense? So there's a lot more into it than just simply burning energy, but that's the best way. And so, yes. So you said that having a high metabolism help you lose weight? Can can help you lose weight. Okay. So if you have a higher metabolism, it means that every single second that you're sitting here, you're burning more calories than someone with a lower metabolism, saving more energy. So let's say I have a, a low metabolism and you have a high metabolism, your body might be using something like, I don't know, 
burning 10 calories every single minute. But mine's only burning maybe five calories every single minute that I'm alive, right? And so what happens is, is every single minute, you're burning twice as many calories as I do, and so it'd be easier for you to lose weight, or you could eat more, things like that. Does that make sense? However, if that gets too high, could that be a problem? Yeah. Yeah, because then you might not be able to eat enough to keep a healthy weight on. Yeah. Cool. So you bring up an interesting point. So with metabolism, Ross, we also have this metabolic rate, which is kind of how much energy does it, how much energy is it taking to keep us alive in a given time point? So that could be a minute, it could be over the course of a day, it could be over the course of an hour, right? You guys are used to a metabolic rate because a lot of people refer to how many calories do I need to eat each day, right? Usually they say around 2,000. Well, if I'm more active, it would take more calories, right? If I'm less active, it might not take as much. So our metabolic rate changes, right? Yes, no? Yeah, it changes. Does it change rapidly? Does, the meta does our metabolic rate change at a very rapid pace? Can we go from not needing a lot of calories to stay alive to needing a whole lot of calories to stay alive very quickly? I feel like it changes slowly. You feel like it changes slowly? So let me ask you this. Right now, is it taking a lot of energy to keep you alive? Not really, right? All of you guys are just sitting there. Um, so let's say someone give me a terrifying animal. Crocodile. Crocodile? Is that it? We all just terrified of crocodiles? Anyone scared of anything else? Lions. Lions. Okay, so I like to take it this way. So I don't like just the normal animals. We're going to make a hybrid animal, like a mythical creature. We're going to have a, a, a lidodile. No, a, a crying. Okay, we're going to have a crying. Okay, it's a mix between a crocodile and a lion. Imagine this. Okay? Crying. It just sounds terrifying, right? Mythical creature. Imagine like a lion with an alligator head, okay, and a big long black tail. Yeah, I know, scary. Okay, so if a crying was to walk in this room, right, is that going to terrify you? Okay, what's your reaction going to be? Okay, yeah, yeah, you're going to run, right? And unfortunately, he's blocking the only exit, so you're going to run this way. When that crying comes into the room and you start trying to run out the window, is how much energy you need to stay alive going to change very rapidly? Yeah, it's going to change almost instantaneously, so our metabolic rate changes constantly. If you stood up, your metabolic rate would change just a little bit, not as much as it did before, and so we have this metabolic rate. And so when we're talking about energy production, we have to talk about food, because food is how we get our energy. That's why a lot of you guys were talking about food when we were looking at metabolic rate earlier. And so with our food, when it comes to our food, there are lots of different things we can eat, but the only things that truly give us energy are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. If it is not a carbohydrate, a fat, or a protein, it does not give you energy, at least directly. It doesn't mean it's not important. Vitamins and minerals are important, but they actually don't have any energy in them. They have no calories. Those help process it, right? Yeah, they help process it. And we'll have our nutrition, we'll talk about it a little bit more, um, but they don't actually give us energy. So believe it or not, you could eat 100 pounds of vitamin C, and there are zero calories in that. There's no energy in 100 pounds of the vitamin C if you ate it. Kind of weird to think about, but that is truly the case. So when it comes to it, we have carbohydrates, fats, and proteins that give us energy. Carbohydrates are simply used for energy only, okay? They're kind of an immediate energy system. So when you eat carbohydrates, they're broken down into what's called glucose in your body. What's another name for glucose? Like something maybe you're more familiar with. Sugar, sugar. yeah, table sugar. Glucose, table sugar, same exact thing. Realize your body doesn't differentiate. So if you eat something like a uh, Twinkie or you eat a piece of broccoli, both of those have carbohydrates in them, and your body's going to break both of those down into glucose regardless. doesn't see any difference. It's the other things in the broccoli that make a difference, right? Because there are vitamins. There are minerals. That's why broccoli is healthier for us. Um, we, do, we can store some glucose as what we call glycogen, but not very much. Our body likes to use glucose as soon as we get it. We don't like to store it for too long. Does that make sense? Fat, though, is a storage form of energy. Fat is how we store our energy for a long period of time. We don't store glycogen for very, we don't store very much glycogen. We don't store it for a very long time. Um, but fat, we store for a really long time. Okay? Your body doesn't like to use fat unless it has to. Okay? So if you do something for a really, really long time, your body will use fat as energy. Or if it's something like really, really low energy, like what you guys are doing right now. Like sitting here right now, your body's mainly using fat to produce energy to keep you alive. But it's very low, so it's not too worried. It, 
we like to store fat as much as possible. Does that make sense? All right? And then the last one we have is protein. We can use protein to make energy, to keep us alive and, and do those types of things, but our body would rather use it to build muscle, to build skin, to build the components of your body. Your body is mostly protein. Following? Right? So we've got this food. Here's the, here's the thing though, is we do eat carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and our body does make those with energy, but we can't use it directly. So if I inject you with like a whole bunch of sugar, like literally just take a syringe and just inject sugar into you, if your body can't process that, okay, it's worthless. The actual only usable way we can, the only usable source of energy in our body is something called ATP or adenosine triphosphate, okay? ATP or adenosine triphosphate is the only usable form of usable form of energy in the body. So basically your body's going to take and convert fats, proteins, and carbohydrates into ATP, and then we can actually utilize it to do things, to stay alive. Making sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So why does sugar give you like an energy boost? It'll make sense here in a minute when we get to it. The way sugar is processed, it happens a lot quicker. Okay. Like we're able to make ATP quicker with it than we are, let's say, fat. Good question, for sure. Um, one of the things I do want to note here is that you see how ATP and then in parentheses adenosine triphosphate. So if I, we're going to see other things like this this semester, when it comes to your exams, when it comes to your exams, if I was to ask you a question about like ATP, I would put ATP parentheses adenosine triphosphate. So you can memorize whichever one's easier for you. Does that make sense? Whether it's the letters, whether it's the name, it doesn't matter to me, but I'll put both on exam. You don't need to recognize one from the other. It'll always be together. Okay. Um, here's the thing with ATP. We can't store very much of it. ATP falls apart very quickly. It disintegrates very quickly in the body or anywhere for that fact. So we can't store very small, we only store very small amounts of it. It's not a great deal. We're talking like a gram or two, like literally a gram, like, which is not very much. When I weigh something like, uh, I think I'm like 80 kilo, no, 84 kilos at the moment. Like there's a lot. Okay. One gram, two grams is not very much. And so we can't store a lot of it, so that means we're constantly having to produce it. Let's talk about how long you think that would last. So I store a little bit of ATP. Imagine my body, when I snap my fingers here in a second, stops producing ATP. Okay? So when I snap my fingers here in a second, I stop producing ATP. Well, how long do you think I would still live? So if I snap my fingers right now, how long do you think I would be able to live until that ATP stores run out? pretty close yep she did the conversion so uh, a little less so probably like 83 82 kilos yeah yeah a little less Did, didn't eat this morning um so what'd you say a minute so it's actually less than that so i would actually if you're if my body and all of your body stop producing atp right now you'd have about five to eight seconds of living that's how little we store it does that make sense right that's how little we store it even just sitting here so our body's constantly having to produce it to keep us alive, and it constantly has to change how quickly we're producing ATP. Because right now, you don't need a lot, correct? But when that cry-in comes in this room and you start running out the door, are you gonna need a lot more ATP at that particular second in time? Yeah, so our body has to be able to produce a whole lot of ATP really, really quickly, kind of in the blink of an eye. And so what we're gonna talk about is three ways our body takes these things and converts our food into ATP. Each system has advantages and disadvantages. And when we combine them, that's how we get to be able to do all the different things we can do. Make sense? Do you have a question? Well, I was just like, we're, we're not like using the ATP where, where, where does it go? It's very instable, so it kind of just falls apart. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. Our so body... Do what? Is it wasted? It can be wasted. Typically our body will do it. And so we'll just burn a little bit more energy, but we'll quickly kind of subside how much we're doing. The body's playing a game of like adjusting this level all the time. Kind of think your car, right? Whole lot of things in your car having to work just right. And if it revs a little too high, you know, when you first crank it, sometimes when it's cold, it revs real high and it slows down. Your body's doing that same thing constantly, making sure there's just enough. Okay, good question. So we're gonna talk about these three systems that um, help us make ATP. Okay, the first system we have is ATP PC. This is where we get into the fact that I have fat fingers on a keyboard and they're all close together. All the letters are there. It should be ATP PC. Okay, all the letters are there. They're just in the wrong order. ATP PC. Okay, um, and 
or and or called the immediate energy system okay this particular system counts our atp stores so that five or six seconds of atp stores um and what it does is it uses this thing called creatine phosphate okay maybe you've heard of creatine before and like people taking creatine powder if they work out so creatine phosphate is a one-step process where we take creatine which we get in our food and we just simply one step make atp out of it it's very very quick this system makes a ton of atp in a very short amount of time okay very very good the problem is is, is this system is really only maximally good for 10 to 20 seconds worth of energy so if i only made atp through atp pc system okay i would literally only be able to i could run as fast as i possibly could but only for about 10 to 20 seconds Think about when you run, right? You can only do it for a short period of time, okay? So this system produces a whole lot of energy very, very quickly, but it gets tired very, very quickly. So imagine that crying, right? Lion, crocodile kind of mixture, right? If it comes in here, you're gonna get up and jump out of your chair and you're gonna run out of the window, right? And you're gonna like Wile E. Coyote style, like, you know, make it a nice little like person frame out of the window. And you're, I know we're on like a second story. You'll fi you're fine, okay? You're scared, but you'll be fine, right? And you're gonna run. And you'll get maybe 100 yards, right? You'll get 50 to 100 yards in that time frame. Do you think that's far enough away where you're not going to get eaten by the crying? No, it's a mythical creature, right? It's, you got, we got to think. Mythical creature, it's going to be able to go a long ways. So can we run for longer than 10 to 20 seconds? Yeah, yeah we can. We might not want to, but we can, right? So if you're running as fast as you possibly can, if you're running as fast as you possibly can, have you ever noticed that after usually about... 10 to 30 seconds, you start to slow down just a little bit, right? You're not able to run quite as fast as you were. Well, that's because the ATP PC system has given, like, kind of tired out. It's given out. It's not working as well anymore. It's too tired. But what's happened is you're still able to run pretty quick because we have our second system. Our second system that helps us produce ATP is called glycolysis or the non oxidative system. Glycolysis or the non oxidative system. Glycolysis picks up where ATP PC system leaves off. It's really good for about 30 seconds. So meaning it, it can make a lot of ATP at 30 seconds though it starts getting tired. And then after about two minutes worth of exercise, it's kind of tapped out. Does that make sense? Right? And so we've got this going on. Realize when it comes to glycolysis, okay, we have what we call glycolysis is anaerobic anaerobic or non-oxidative so both of these names anaerobic or non-oxidative both mean that they do not use oxygen that oxygen isn't needed for that system meaning that you actually can hold your breath and you'll make atp with this system okay you don't have to have oxygen have you ever noticed like if, if something scares you or if you if someone like does something to you and you're trying to chase after them right maybe like a brother or sister right you all had these you start chasing after them and maybe you catch them and you weren't really breathing that hard and then all of a sudden it catches up to you right like you're done with the exercise and then all of a sudden you're like why am i so tired all of a sudden right like it catches you that's because what happened is you were running so hard glycolysis was making your energy we didn't need oxygen and then that when you stopped and when that system kind of caught back up you started breathing heavy right it kind of caught up to you does that make sense mm -hmm. So this system is really cool because it allows our bodies to catch up. When you're running from that crying, it's going to take a little while for us to start breathing more and to get oxygen all to all of our muscles that need it. And so we have a system that's going to help us make ATP until all that catches up. Following? Right? And so we have that glycolysis. If you break this down, fun little like way to use words and stuff, you have, if you get rid of the word lysis, you have glyco. Glyco is the root word for glucose. What does that mean the system takes to run? Sugar. It takes our carbohydrates. It takes sugars to run. Only sugar. So it takes gly glucose or glycogen to be able to run the system. So really what this means, lysis, if you ever see lysis at the end of a word, it simply means to cut. And so what happens in this system is you simply cut glucose apart to make ATP. That's what the body does. Cuts glucose apart to make ATP. Um, we can only use glucose and glycogen in this, okay? And so what you're seeing here is you were asking earlier why um, if I eat a lot of sugar, sometimes we get that like kind of jitters and that rush. Well, what happens is, is glycolysis starts functioning a little bit faster because there's so much sugar in the system and it makes a good bit of ATP pretty quickly, 
sometimes quicker than what we actually need it to be. Yeah? Um, and we don't want to store a lot of it, so it just kind of burns a little quicker. Yeah, until we get rid of it. And you just jitter because it needs something to do. It doesn't want to waste it. Um, so we have all this happening. At the very end of this process, at the very end of glycolysis, we always have byproducts, right? When you eat food, there's always something left over, right? You're like, wait, no. Like when your body, you eat food, you put it in, and your body processes it, is there always something left over? What's the end of the food process? Um, uh, yeah, pooping, right? Like we defecate, right? Like there's always something left over. In every process, there's something left over. And so in this particular process, what we have left over is something called lactic acid or lactate. Have you guys ever heard of lactic acid? Yeah. yeah. Is that what like makes your muscles sore? Okay, so pretty typically, people, have, if they've heard about lactic acid, they've maybe heard something like, it makes your muscles sore. Have you guys heard this before? Like a cramp. Okay, so, cramp, not quite. Muscle soreness is out there. People say like, ooh, my muscles are sore, like I've got lactic acid in there. And maybe you've heard of people like rubbing it out, maybe a little bit, right? I'm here to tell you, that that's a lie. You've been lied to your whole life by people who should know better, like your coaches or people in, that were teaching you your health class in high school. They should know better. It doesn't cause muscle soreness. Okay, and we'll talk about why. If you're sore, let's say you work out, how long are you sore for? Day or two is pretty typical, right? Day or two. With lactic acid, realize this is the byproducts from um, glycolysis, okay? And it's an acid. If I was to throw acid on you, what would happen? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to, right? But what would happen? If I threw a bunch of acid on you, what, how would it feel? Bad? It would burn, right? It would like kind of burn your skin, right? And so acid burns. Acid, our body doesn't like very strong acids. And so what happens is lactic acid, let's say in my legs, like I'm running and it builds up. What's going to happen is I'm actually going to start feeling a burning sensation in my legs because the pH is dropped. There's an acid inside. Have you ever run for like maybe kind of done something for a long time or done something really intense and you feel like your legs are on fire your arms are on fire like someone's touching them with a hot poker mm -hmm. right that's because lactic acid's there and that's the body's way of saying hey you're trying to kill yourself and we want you to stop that's literally what it's, it's saying it's like hey this is bad for us there's a lot of acid we want you to stop that burning sensation goes on as long as you continue to exercise but if you stop exercising right does that burning sensation go away no after, after a little bit after a little bit, right? And when we say a little bit, a couple minutes, yeah. right? After a few minutes, that burning sensation goes away. Well, once that burning sensation has gone away, the acid is gone, and we've actually, all the lactic acid is gone out of that system within a couple minutes. Once the burning stops, the lactic acid is gone. And so it's kind of weird to think about if something's gone in a couple minutes, how does it cause muscle soreness two days later? That's not, it doesn't. It doesn't. What well, does? Okay, so typically what causes muscle soreness is when you work out, when you move your muscles, especially intensely, your muscles actually tear. Okay, now they, we're not talking like tearing a sheet of paper in half, we're talking microscopic tears. And so that hurts because literally there's a small injury and your body heals that over the course of about 24 to 48 hours. And that tearing is a good thing. It's not a bad thing because when it rebuilds, it rebuilds bigger and stronger. Does that make sense? It's kind of preparing you so hopefully we don't tear them again. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah, but we do, right? And then it builds up stronger, and that's the whole process of exercise, right? Um, so lactic acid doesn't last very long. And what happens to it is we're going to talk about what happens to it because we have three energy systems. And so it actually goes into the next energy system. It's the starting for the next energy system for, to make more, more ATP, okay? Certain places love ATP more than others. My heart, sorry, love ATP. Some organs and some body parts love lactic acid more than others. My heart would love nothing more than for me to cut it out of my chest and just place it in a, like a bucket of lactic acid. It'd be so happy. It'd be like, oh, this is a great day. Your heart loves to use lactic acid to make ATP. Your brain doesn't like lactic acid to make ATP. It loves glucose. That's what your brain wants, is sugar. It's the best way it makes ATP is through sugar. Does that make sense? So everything's kind of there. So we've got this glycolysis happening. And so it picks up where ATP cuts off, 15, 20 seconds or so, and it can last up to two minutes. So if you think about it, if that, that crying comes in the room, we get decently far in 20 seconds, but then we slow down a little bit, right? 
and we can run for about two minutes, right? We can run for two minutes. Do you think you'll be far enough away from the crying to, to not be eaten in two minutes? No, again, mythical creature, right? Use your imagination, right? Can we run for longer than two minutes? Yeah. For sure. We can 100% run for longer than two minutes. And so what we have is we have our third and final energy system. Okay? So we've got a whole lot of ATP really, really quickly, but gets tired really, really quickly. It makes a little less ATP and lasts a little bit longer. And then our last system, oxidative phosphorylation or oxidative system, oxidative phosphorylation or oxidative system, is the slowest at making ATP, but what do you think the advantage of it is? It lasts the longest. It lasts the longest. So we should start getting something, first of all, by the name. It says oxidative, non-oxidative. So think about what that might mean. We'll get there in a second. With oxidative phosphorylation, this is the only system where we can convert fats into ATP and use them for energy. It's the only system where we can use proteins to make ATP. And we also will use lactic acid, the byproducts from glycolysis, to make ATP. This is the main way we like to make energy if we can, but it's our slowest system. So it's not always practical to do so. This system is aerobic or oxidative, meaning that we need oxygen at the very end of it. So when this whole system's done, when this whole system's done, we have some hydrogens left over, and we're gonna take some oxygen that we breathe in, and we're gonna make water. That's really what we're gonna do. We're gonna take oxygen and make water. Um, is breathing important? It's very, very important, right? You all think, you're like, yes, breathing is very important, right? We breathe to get oxygen in. We die without breathing, right? Here's the craziest thing. The only, the only reason that you need oxygen, the only reason you breathe in oxygen is because you need oxygen to make water at the very end of oxidative phosphorylation. If this system worked differently, or if we didn't make ATP using oxidative phosphorylation, you'd have no reason whatsoever to breathe. That's crazy to think about, right? The entire reason you breathe is simply to make some water at the end of oxidative phosphorylation. That's it. Really cool. This really important thing comes down to just making some water, right? So it's aerobic, meaning we've got to breathe. Um, this system is two minutes and longer. So at two minutes, if you're running full out at, for two straight minutes, at about the two minute mark, you're going to notice that you start slowing down just a little bit more. And then you're going to kind of just plateau out, like whatever speed that is, you can keep that up for a good while, right? How long theoretically could I jog for? Out, 30 minutes, okay. An hour, can we, can we go for longer than an hour? Maybe you don't want to, right? And maybe, maybe none of us in this class could, but can people? Yeah. Yeah. How long can people actually run for? hours so believe it or not it can actually even be over a day in almost two days people can actually run for it now it's not necessarily the healthiest thing okay it's not necessarily advised there's a lot of things with it but i had a friend okay she works for the military and she was stationed in um the uk and she did what they called run across europe so this was a series of marathons across europe and it all ended in a um what they call an ultra marathon, which is anything over 26 miles, and her ultra marathon was 100 miles. She started this race and ran 100 miles without stopping, and it took her about 25 and a half hours. She ran for 25 and a half hours without stopping. Now, she did have to eat along the way and drink along the way. It was kind of as you go, you slow down a little bit and eat and drink and that type of thing. And I'm not saying it was great for her body. Her body was not better off for this, right? That's a really long time. But your body can go for a really, really long time. And so in that 25 hours that she was running, this was the main way she was making energy, through fats and byproducts from glycolysis and proteins. It's two minutes and longer. Um, another thing we wanna talk about with this system is, have you guys ever heard of something called the mitochondria? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, most of you have heard about a thing called a mitochondria probably back in seventh, eighth grade. And if you're not familiar, it was that, you, you saw your biology textbook and they would show the cell that was this clear circle, right? And inside that circle in the center was a purple circle and inside that purple circle was a darker purple circle. And always in the bottom right-hand corner was this thing that looked like a ribbon called the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. And then finally, always, for whatever reason, all the textbooks forever are always the same. In the bottom left-hand corner is this red pill-shaped thing called the mitochondria. You guys, you're like, oh yeah, it's like you saw my textbook. I've seen one and they're all the same. 
What was the only thing you ever had to know about the mitochondria that all of you still know today? Powerhouse of the cell, right? You all remember that, right? The mitochondria, you told to memorize it's the powerhouse of the cell, and that was it. Never talked about it again. Just memorize that fact. So you ask questions, they never could answer them. The reason the mitochondria is called the powerhouse of the cell is because oxidative phosphorylation happens inside the mitochondria. That's the only thing that's really happening inside the mitochondria is oxidative phosphorylation, and a majority of energy we use throughout our life is made through this system. Meaning that if the mitochondria wasn't there, we wouldn't do a very good job of living and being able to move. Does that make sense? Yeah? I know, science-y, it's, but we're skimming the surface, trying to skim the surface. Realize in oxidative phosphorylation, glucose must be present in order for this system to work. So, if you're not making ATP through glucose, if you don't have lactic acid left over at the end of that, lactic acid is the very first step in oxidative phosphorylation. If that isn't present, this system stops or slows down greatly. Okay? So, the reason that this is so important is when it comes to eating and the things we eat. Have you guys ever heard of maybe some diets out there, ways people eat, where they tell you to maybe cut out your carbohydrates? Yeah, so there's some keto out there to some extent. There are things like the Atkins diet. There are all kinds of diets out there that say you should stop eating carbohydrates, right? Or you should reduce those greatly. Well, that's a big issue. We don't want to do that because what happens is you can't store a lot of sugar in your body. And so eventually you're going to run out. And when you run out, you can't really make energy through this system either. Is I don't know if any of you have ever done those, so maybe you have, or maybe you've known someone to do that, those kind of diets, right? And if you have, I'm just gonna guess that that person probably felt pretty decent for the first couple days, and after about three or four days of eating very low carbohydrates or no carbohydrates, I bet they were really, really tired and felt like they had no energy. Most people do because what happens is, is their body's having a hard time producing ATP and it's slowing them down. Yes, ma'am. I did a very, very low Thing. Didn't go so well, did it? It did it? I, no, it wasn't. Okay, yeah, it did. Right, were you pretty tired? Like, kind I was of. tired and, like, constipated all the time. Yeah, and so that's not. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. And so what happens is, is be, part of the reason for that is constipation. An issue with constipation is that we don't have enough liquid in our intestines, kind of like in that, in our fecal matter. We don't have enough liquid. And part of the reason we have liquid in there is because all the things that contain carbohydrates usually contain water. The That's things, true. proteins and fats and those type of things, usually don't hold a lot of water, and so it tends to, we become slightly dehydrated and can lead to constipation. Does that make sense? Right? And so this is why it's so important. And then finally, what's really cool is because this system uses oxygen, and it's the only place we use oxygen in the body, we can actually figure out how well you make energy through oxidative phosphorylation surely by measuring how much oxygen you can breathe in and out and actually use. And so that's maximal oxygen consumption. So basically we see like, hey, we're gonna make you exercise and see how much oxygen your body can actually utilize from the air it breathes in, and we can tell how well you do this, right? The better, the more oxygen you can consume, the more energy you produce using this system. I mean, the better you might be at something like running or swimming or things like that. Make sense? Yes? Uh, okay, cool. Um, so I want to go back and clarify just a couple things with this because I paint it as one way, and then I want to make sure that it's not to, you know, always seen that way. So the way I was talking about this, it may have seemed like only one system can function at a time, like a light switch, basically saying that, um, like right now, all of you may be using oxidative phosphorylation, and when the crying comes in the room, maybe um, ATP PC kind of like turns on, and it's the only light in the room making ATP, and then in 20 seconds it just becomes tired, and it shuts itself off, and the next light comes on, right, like glycolysis. They don't work that way. They work like dimmer switches. So dimmer switches, think about how you can make a, a light really bright or make it really dull, right? Maybe you've been sitting in a nice restaurant, and it gets dark all of a sudden, you're like, oh, it's going bad, right? Like those are dimmers, right? Mm -hmm. So. All three of these systems are currently making ATP in your body right now and in mine. However, it's which one's the brightest bulb in the room. When the cryon comes in here and you start running, ATP PC is the brightest light in the room, and then as it gets tired, it gets dimmer and dimmer, making less ATP, and glycolysis becomes the brightest light in the room. And then as it gets tired, it becomes dimmer, and um, oxidative phosphorylation becomes the brightest light in the room. Does that make sense? So you're always using all three of them. 
all three of them. Um, we train each system individually. Each system is trained individually. So what we're saying here is, is if you want to improve your oxidative phosphorylation system, we're going to have to do activities that go greater than two minutes. If I want my ATPPC system to be better, I've got to go all out for 10 to 20 seconds. Does that make sense? Did any of you do activities maybe in high school or throughout your life? Yeah? What, what activity did you do? Basketball. Basketball? Anybody? Well, I, I do CrossFit right now. You do CrossFit right now? What did you do? I BMX and I played golf in high school. Okay, so BMX and um, played golf, or yeah, played golf in high school. Um, so let's think about this for a second. I'll use basketball as the first example. If you did something wrong in practice, you were late, missed a day, something like that, was there a punishment, quote unquote? Yeah. Yeah, what was that punishment? So, like, mispractice? If you mispractice, yeah, what would you have to do? You'd have to run before practice. Okay, you'd run. How would you run? Uh, was it like miles, like around a track, or what? Yeah. It was miles around a track? Okay, so think about the game of basketball, right? Think about the game of basketball. Do the people that play basketball, do they run just constantly, kind of at a constant pace through an entire basketball game? Yeah. Like, they're constantly moving. They're constantly moving. They're not really constantly yeah. running. Okay, so they're moving a good bit, right? But you don't see a guy just kind of going here and then he gets to the side and he goes back, right? Like, more likely what basketball players do is they run real fast to the other side, right? They kind of guard, they do some things that they're taking a small break. I'm not talking about a big one a small break, and then they run to the other side again, right? Well, with this small break in between, right, and they also have timeouts, and they also have things that they take some short breaks in that, <coughs> running two, three miles constantly is not going to train the right system. What basketball players, they're not really utilizing oxidative phosphorylation as much as they're using glycolysis, right? They're going, and then they get a short break, they kind of let it rebuild, and they go again, right? And so it'd be better off, what a lot of basketball players tend to do, is they actually tend to do suicides, where they get on a basketball court and they run basically down and back, and they take a short break and they gotta do it again. And they gotta do it again. Because that's more like what they're gonna do in their activity. Does that make sense? Um, another example is if you've ever seen football players, like maybe you saw the football team when you were in high school, it tends to be like their coach was always making them run like three miles before practice started. I laugh every time I see a bunch of football players running mile after mile. Has a football player ever had a need to run a mile? No, most of them never will run more than about 10 yards, right? And so they'd be better off to have these players sprint 10 yards, rest for a couple seconds, and then sprint another 10 yards. Yes? I like when I play football, my comment, we have to run from the field goal, we have to run around the Okay, so that's more similar where he's kind of running around for the it's already, you know, kind of the the time of a game and taking a break. Those would be better off than just going for a straight run. Does that make sense? The cool thing though is if you are active, if you are active, all systems will improve slightly but one of those systems is going to improve more than the other, right? It's just like when I go for a run, I do get stronger, but the main thing is not getting stronger, right? It's just kind of a byproduct of what's going on. You guys good here? Making sense? And that's kind of the science behind those energy systems, okay? We're not going to get much deeper than that. Realize if you go on, if you look more at sciences throughout your career or you do something related to this, um, that you want to make sure um, that basically realize that there's much more complexity to this. It goes into a lot more depth. So don't think I've told you the whole picture. With all of that, before we talk about what we do for exercise, I want, we want to talk quickly about the benefits of exercise. Okay? And that's because, um, well, there's a lot of benefits from exercise. And you, I think I told you guys to kind of cover these on your own in the video. So we'll go through them pretty quick. Um, but realize your heart gets stronger when you exercise doing things like cardiovascular endurance exercise, so running, biking, jogging, playing sports, your heart's going to get stronger because it is a muscle. And just like any muscle, it's going to improve. And so the whole reason that your heart gets stronger is so that it can move more blood. Yes? Can your heart get like those micro tears that your muscles move through? So good question. So your heart is always working. Yeah. So it's it never really gets a break, right? Like it's constantly... 
doing that. And so it does get some of those micro tears, um, but they're a much different way. So when we talk about, we'll talk about muscle in the next chapter. Um, cardiac muscle is its actually own type of muscle. There's nothing even close to what the heart and the way it works and the way it looks and the way it acts. But yes, it gets some of those micro tears and it just is a little bit different on how they work and it gets stronger. But it will kind of do the same exact thing. Good question. Um, and no, it's nothing to worry about. You can't exercise so hard that you tear your heart in half. If you do, that was called a medical condition that should have been spotted like with your regular doctor. Does that make sense? Um, so we have that. Um, realize you'll also increase you'll reduce your blood pressure. So because your heart's stronger, it doesn't have to work as hard to move blood through your system. This is a typo. If you work out, you will increase your BO or body odor. You will get stinkier and need to shower more, right? Not reduce it. Um, other improvements we see, we see improvements to our cells, okay? Um, our cells become more efficient. We also increase the number of capillaries. Capillaries is where diffusion happens in your muscles, okay? so. Your blood runs into your muscles and there's a capillary that it runs through which is very, very tiny microscopic. And this is how all the things get out of your blood into your muscles. And so what happens is we increase the number of capillaries when you exercise and this allows us to get things to your muscles quicker like oxygen or nutrients or glucose or fats. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, you'll also increase the number and the size of the mitochondria in your body which means that we can do, make more ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, which means that we can do things for longer periods of time. Um, it will also help reduce your risk for things like cardiovascular disease, which is things like heart attacks, strokes. Um, this help includes reducing cholesterol. Do you guys know what cholesterol is? Probably heard of it, right? Yeah? So cholesterol is simply a measure of how much fat is in the blood. You need fat in your blood, but we don't want that to be too high. So when you exercise, you help get rid of some of that fat because we're going to use a lot, utilize it as energy. Um, you'll help reduce your risk for cancers, for type 2 diabetes, and diabetes is controlling how much sugar is in our blood. We need sugar in our blood, but we don't want too much. And if we have a hard time controlling that, that's called type diabetes. Um, we help reduce our risk for osteoporosis, um, inflammation. Inflammation is, what's another name for inflammation? It's another word for inflammation. Swelling. Swelling. Yeah. So when we say this, we don't we're not talking about like if you roll your ankle and it swells up, like exercise is gonna make that go down. No, no, that's gonna make it worse. But your organs actually swell. They get inflamed, and exercising helps reduce that and keeps you healthy. Okay. Um, finally, the coolest thing to me is when you exercise, you actually reduce your risk from dying of anything in the entire world. So when you exercise, your risk from dying from anything in the entire world is reduced. And so that's a cool thing to think about. So every time you go for an exercise, like if I go for a run today, I'm like, sweet, I'm less likely to die of anything today than I was before I did that. Okay? Now, it doesn't always make sense. Okay? It's just statistics and the way it works. So we're even saying, like, let's say you get in a helicopter crash. Okay? Let's say we get in a helicopter crash. Sorry, too soon. My bad. My boy Kobe, I forgot. My, my apologies. Okay. Too soon. But let's say, let's say we get in a helicopter crash. Okay. Me and you get in a helicopter crash. You exercise and I don't. You're more likely to survive that than I am. The reason we think about that, okay, the reason we can kind of say, it's not, it's not means like you're Superman, like you're going to like, I'll go, you know, always be able to live. But your body is used to being put under stress, being used to coming close to death when we exercise. And so your body's better able to handle any kind of trauma that happens to it. So you're a little bit more likely to survive. We're not saying like crazy survive, just a little bit more likely. Does that make sense? That was a slight edge, but not that much. Right, a slight edge, not that much. Kind of same thing, car accident. More likely to survive if you exercise than not. Right? Time do you guys get out of here? 10 20. Okay, there you go, a couple more minutes. Um, I think there's one more. Um, realize that body weight is better controlled with exercise. It's not the only thing, but it definitely helps. Um, your immune system actually improves as well. Okay, your immune system improves with exercise, and so this is really good. So your immune system keeps you from getting sick, okay? And so you get less colds. Those days where you just don't feel good, kind of clogged up, you don't want to get out of bed, but you do anyways, you have less days of that typically when you exercise. 
We all have that one friend who's sick like every two weeks. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I was like, oh yeah, uh uh-huh. Typically, that person probably doesn't exercise quite as much, and if they did, would probably reduce those days of not feeling well, okay? Realize when it comes to this, just because it improves your immune system doesn't mean it makes you invincible where you can't get sick, okay? Um, If you exercise, that doesn't mean you can go up to someone with the coronavirus and be like, cough in my mouth, I can't get it. You will, okay? You'll be in quarantine. It also doesn't mean you need to walk around and be like, oh, sweet, I ran five miles today. I can't get chlamydia or HIV. Yes, you will, okay? It just means that it makes you a little less susceptible to getting sick. And then finally, it also helps improve your psychological and emotional well-being. Makes it where you are less, less likely to be depressed. Um, may make you feel happier, more satisfied with life. Part of the reason is it helps improve your sleep. And you also release all kinds of chemicals into your brain that just make you feel better. It actually even makes you smarter. It's been proven time and time again, if you exercise, you'll do better in school. Especially if you exercise kind of before you came to class or if you started your day with it, you actually would be able to focus a little bit better in class. And so those are some good things. Does that make sense? Right? So that finishes our kind of section on science and benefits. And so we're really close and I don't want to really start this too much. So when you guys come back on Wednesday, you actually have class Wednesday. I know, shocker, you actually have class Wednesday. But when you guys come back on Wednesday, we'll pick up here um, and we should get through... Oh, a good chunk. We might not fully finish this PowerPoint, but we we'll, should have enough information where we can probably go ahead and get you your next lap. That'll be good Sunday. So you can take a look at that if you want to, but this is where we'll pick up on Wednesday. Any questions? You guys good? Yes. Awesome. Well, you all have a great day. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you on Wednesday. <coughs>